I studied filmmaking in the U.S. during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We'll continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Hi. Today we will interview an incredible individual who besides being a brave politician is a very skilled snake hunter. Someone who hunted down poisonous snakes as a young man and turned it eventually into a business. Later on in life, he pursued those who spread venom in society and almost got away with it. Watch this interview. He was born near his mother's farm in Maryland. He enlisted in the Marines in 1963. By age 21, Black became a second lieutenant and was among the Marines' youngest aircraft carrier qualified pilots. He flew 269 combat helicopter missions in Vietnam. Ground fire struck his aircraft on four different occasions. After the war, he served as a flight instructor and later attended engineer school. Black graduated second from engineer officer's class and was made a company commander. He deployed his 240-man unit to Vicks Island, Puerto Rico. There, Captain Black's Marines rebuilt the island runway. Black left the Marines to attend the University of Florida. There, he was twice elected to the student senate. He graduated with honors from the School of Business in 1973 and earned a law degree in 1976. Black headed the Army's Criminal Law Division at the Pentagon. He developed executive orders for the president's signature, and laws that were enacted by Congress. He advised senior government officials on issues of national significance. He testified before the U.S. Congress, representing the U.S. Army, on four occasions. In 1994, Colonel Dick Black retired from military service. He is admitted to practice before the U.S. Supreme Court and the Supreme Court of Virginia. He has held a top-secret security clearance. Colonel Black was elected to the House of Delegates in February 1998 and was elected to serve in the Virginia State Senate on November 8, 2011 and proudly serves the citizens. Great, great. Senator, I'd like to begin my, my first question with, um, I appreciate what you've been doing also. I, there, there are two activities that you have done. One is towards Syria, and the, one, the other one is you wrote a letter to President Trump warning him about Iran, uh, that uh, yeah. he, he doesn't fall into the trap. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, well, you know, I got involved, actually, I started watching what was going on when we we made an unprovoked attack on Libya and totally destroyed it, killed a great number of people. And it's been without a government, without a, a real functional government ever since we attacked. And so I began to watch it and say, why did we do this? What, what inspired us? Because I've always been interested in foreign affairs since I was a, just a small child. And, uh, and so one thing led to another. I started off thinking, well, this must be a war, war over oil. And uh, the more that I got into it, the more convinced I was that while there were certain things, we wanted to affect the oil market. We wanted to loot the treasury, which was huge. Uh, Libya was very prosperous. And, uh, and now all of the gold and the silver has disappeared. 
149 tons of gold. But the number one objective was that they had a huge arsenal of advanced weapons. Uh, and what we, what we wanted to do was to use those weapons to overthrow the government of Syria. And so as I discovered that, then I, I became involved in tracing the war in Syria. And I have followed it literally from before it began. And it was clear at the very beginning, and WikiLeaks has released documents that showed that um, from the outset, the war has been inspired by Al Qaeda and by the Muslim Brotherhood, by by militant jihadists who were intent on uh, on overthrowing the government. And not only that, they have about two million Christians in uh, in Syria. And then they have a small, I don't know the number of uh, Shia, it's 3.4%. Uh, and their, their objective was to behead all of these people and, and other minorities, the, the Alawi, and uh, kill them and then make slaves of their, of their wives. And wherever they have gone, this is what they've done. And uh, they, ISIS split off from, from uh, Al Qaeda, but they always fought shoulder to shoulder. So even though we've been told there are, you know, a hundred different uh, rebel groups, the fact is you look at who do they fight with? They fight shoulder to shoulder with Al Qaeda. And, uh, and Idlib province is now dominated by Al Qaeda. So, so anyway, so I, I got very involved. And at a certain point, I wrote a letter to, uh, to Bashar al-Assad, President al-Assad, and uh, I thanked him because they had conducted a very skillful uh, clearing maneuver where they had advanced and they had released a lot of people who were under the tyranny of Al-Qaeda. And uh, now I, I focused my letter on the Christians because I knew this would cause a real explosion here in this country. No one was supposed to speak to to Syrians or to President Assad. So I focused on the Christians. I said, thank, I want to thank the Syrian army for its gallant rescue of the Christians along the Kalaman mountain range, and especially for, for rescuing the 13 nuns who were held as, as human shields. And so I got a response back saying, would you mind if we put this up on the First Lady's Facebook? I said, that's fine. I said, go ahead. So the First Lady, uh, Asma Saad, one of the most wonderful First Ladies in the world, if not the first, the best, um, she put it up on her Facebook. And immediately there was just a volcanic eruption around the world against the fact that one person had dared to write a letter to President Bashar al-Assad and thank him. Uh, and I also said in that letter, I said, I cannot explain to you why the United States, which lost 3,000 people to al-Qaeda attacks on 9-11, is now providing arms and support to al-Qaeda in Syria. Well, I, we got calls day and night coming in. Uh, the phones, all of our phones were ringing off the hook. Some people loved us for saying it. Some people hated us for saying it. But I said, okay, the people who, who are angry, I will speak to them personally. And everyone that I did, they'd say, well, you really know what you're talking about. Uh, I, some of them would be converted and others would say, well, I don't believe you, but I don't believe the way you do, but, uh, but I respect you. Uh, finally, people stopped calling. They said, you know, every time that we talk to this guy, then he knows what he's talking about more than we do. And so they just quit. 
and we've gotten the the letters of gratitude ever since. Uh, but I had I had the group of uh, of FBI agents come out to the house, and they you know they came on the pretext that they were trying to rescue some some journalists, and I'm a little you know I, it's a little questionable, but uh, I, I think in a way they were trying to get something that I had done that was wrong, and. I just lectured the four of them for about a year and a, or for about an hour and a half, and uh, and finally they were just sitting there, you know, with their heads, you know, their eyes drooping, and they, you know, it's about all they could take. Because you get me on Syria, and and uh, uh, you know, I won't stop. But that was that was the letter, and then I went to Syria. I went in 2016, and. Uh, I went to Palmyra. It had been liberated by the Syrian army for the first time, and they were literally clearing mines uh, in the city when I went. So it was it was a very rough time. Uh, and shortly after I left, they recaptured ISIS recaptured Palmyra briefly, and then eventually the Syrian army took it for good. But uh, uh, I saw, I talked to the Syrian soldiers. I saw them, and uh, and they're they're magnificent soldiers, and they've been through incredible things. If you think of it, Syria has fought since 2011. So for eight years, you have a country, a small country of 23 million people. And they fought off two thirds of the world's industrial and military might, and they're still standing. I mean, it it really is one of the great acts of valor and heroism of all world history. Is what the what the Syrians have done. So I went back in 2018, and uh, of course, you know, on both occasions I. I spoke extensively with uh, President Assad. And in 2018, uh, I was able to drive with a very minor escort. I mean, they, we didn't even have any long weapons. The first time I had a I had a 12 vehicle convoy. I had air support uh, flying right alongside on our flanks. I had three uh, cannon mounted on uh, platforms and uh, and we raced across the desert uh, so that because this was ISIS held territory and we we raced so that we wouldn't be ambushed the second time two years later in 2018 much thanks to the Iranian help and the Russian help um, the uh, we were able to drive safely and with almost no security. And it, the funny thing is that we uh, uh, we stopped. I would just say, okay, I want to stop here. And we'd stop at, at a shepherd's hut, you know, some, some very impoverished shepherd or just ordinary people at little places that tourists never go. And... Uh, and the thing that I noticed everywhere we went, the people were so joyous that the government of President Assad was back in control and they despised the terrorist. You know, they never talk about it, but here after eight years of combat and the death of half a million people, not one single terrorist has ever emerged as a possible leader of the country. Now that's pretty amazing. So what you have is you have you have the US, the UK, France, and these uh, these Gulf dictatorships like uh, like Saudi Arabia and uh, and others. and they've poured weapons, they've recruited jihadists from all over the world. And they have attacked Syria. 
if if it hadn't been for the outside influence, the war would have been over. It, it never would have been a war. It would have been simply a domestic, you know, some some domestic unrest as all countries have. But we turned it into a war very deliberately. Uh, the United States was the was the nation that planned and instigated the war against against Syria. And it's it's fairly clear, thanks to WikiLeaks, uh, we have the documentation. Uh, we know what we were planning, and uh, and so uh, I just my aim is to see peace and just to see an end to the slaughter and these cruel sanctions. Sanctions are one of the cruelest weapons known because they they hurt poor people. They create uh, people freeze to death in the winter. Uh, they starve to death in other times. Uh, people who have cancer go without cancer medications. Uh, uh, soldiers and civilians who have lost limbs they can't get prosthetic devices. It's a, it's a hideously cruel thing. And the, the public is not aware of it. It's sanctions is some nebulous thing. But I've seen sanctions. I've seen what they do on the ground. And, uh, and uh, it's a terrible weapon to use against people. Uh, uh, Senator, would, have you ever pondered about uh, coming to Iran to, to make a speech or to travel around to speak at universities? like some of your other colleagues who have come to Iran have, have spoken at various universities and taken part uh, in, in these venues. Have you ever thought about, because you've been to Syria and, and that's really breaking the red line and, and being single and you've experienced how you were attacked. Um, but Iran is also a, a different story. Have you thought about coming to Iran? Has ever anyone invited you to come to Iran? I have, uh, I have thought about it and uh um, but uh, nothing specific has ever been planned. Um, right. And, you know, I, I, want you, I want you to know, I, I am a very patriotic American. And, uh, you know, I've, I fought in the, in the U.S. Marines. I was wounded and uh, my radio men were both killed right beside me. And I also flew as a helicopter pilot, flew 269 combat missions. And uh, on one occasion, we were machine gunned and, and we lost our rudder control and crash landed. So uh, unlike John Bolton, who was a draft dodger, he, he liked the fact that we were fighting, but he was a draft dodger, just like Dick Cheney. Dick Cheney, who instigated uh, the war against uh, Iraq, he was a draft dodger. He was a coward. Both men were are simply cowards who refused to go, but then they cheered from the sidelines. They thought, "Oh, the war is great, but I'm I'm not going to risk myself." So I have a, a particular disdain that's that's personal to me from uh, from my many patrols in the jungle and my many flights uh, in the air and. Uh, I can understand people who opposed the war not going, but people who supported the war and yet had, uh, they lacked the courage to get involved and to risk themselves. So those people I, I have no, no love for at all. Yes, uh, it, it stands out. I know that uh, your experience as a Vietnam veteran who also has won a Purple Heart, it stands out in your career and that's why uh, it's very interesting to speak with you. I was in the States when the veterans were coming back from Vietnam. I saw them with PTSD. Uh, I used to work in a lumber mill uh, when I was a, a late teenager. And, and I, one of those PT, PTSD um, uh, veterans once attacked me. I mean, the guy was so off. Really? Yes, I mean, this is, we were just, I was just a lumber mill worker there, you know, for minimum yeah. wage, you know, a 17 year old. And, but I saw- Good job. <laughs> yeah, but I saw what the war had done to a lot of Americans. And I was so happy that it ended in 1974. And I, I think that the lessons of Vietnam should have been enough for Americans not to get involved with other wars. 
that are also uh, they were they were for a while and uh there we we made a lot of uh, a lot of movies came out of hollywood that uh they sort of mocked the military and uh i i remember one there's a funny movie it's a good movie actually it's goldie hawn and it was called stripes and it was it was just funny you know with uh uh you know sort of the the some of the military guys clowning around but the officers were always presented as being you know kind of kind of uh, wacky irresponsible people and then when uh when they produced the movie saving private ryan it was it was deadly serious even though it was fictional it was it was very serious it was very realistic the combat was realistic the soldiers were portrayed in a heroic light uh, which was very appropriate but i told my wife i said i said you know what I said what i said we're going to war she said why do you say that i said because hollywood has changed the theme yes you're right the decision has been made that we're going to go to war right. because now we're beginning to start the process of indoctrinating people to believe now war war is horrible and yet it's heroic so you can kind of you can pick your pick your uh theme but uh the fact that we we've we've uh, given a generation this idea that about the glories of war and uh and i i saw it coming i mean literally on that day i said we're going to war she said why yes. i said because they've changed the the theme in hollywood yes exactly exactly uh by the way um just 6 months before 9/11 they had another hollywood splashy movie called pro harbor and uh it was america being attacked and yes. they, they had never made a movie like that uh um uh, ben affleck was was acting in it it was a super story very glamorous very colorful but it was i believe it was like it almost appeared it was concocted because it came it was released like 6 7 months before before 911 in 2001 meaning it was, it was the, and the message was when america gets attacked it has to retaliate now we have and it was almost as if you're preparing subconsciously that i was kind of surprised <clears throat> as you said about private ryan you felt intuitively that something you heard drums from hollywood yes. there i i i heard drums uh and and sure enough 6 months later you had uh, 911 which are there are different theories about what happened um uh, and it's actually also a red line i know that talking about 911 and the, what really happened 911 is a red line today uh but anyhow that movie pearl harbor which uh, was a super uh uh production was also suspiciously coming out 6 months before and it was a message about what's to come so i'm, I'm glad that you brought up the private ryan because spielberg really did a very strong army story bigger than anyone had seen before it was a, it was a great story it was very well made too i mean it was a touching uh yeah. with Brad Pitt and and um I don't know not Brad Pitt the other actor anyhow it was a touching story it was a heroic story but it was really saying uh the army had to prepare remember our good old days in world war 2 remember d day and uh, let's prepare ourselves for the upcoming action that's is going to come yes well you know it was disturbing that uh recently uh Vice President Pence uh, made a comment at uh, the one of the military academies and he said he said you will definitely be in combat. Now, I've never heard anything like that said before. I you know, I went through a 32 year career in the military and I served one blazing year in combat 
And other than that, uh, it was relatively peaceful. And here, you know, we they have indoctrinated people to where they expect a, a nonstop war. Nobody talks about peace. Peace in our times. In the First World War, they they had to sell us on on going to war by saying, "Well, we'll this will be the war to end all wars." Uh, and uh, of course, it was far from being the war to end all wars. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, you know, I'm going to jump to something a little bit lighter. Uh, uh, you you touch subjects that are very poisonous and very venomous, and yet your hobby is uh, hunting for poisonous snakes somewhere in the, in the West. Tell me about that hobby. I mean, how, how did you pick that up? Well, it, it, it was, I had a cousin who was, uh, he was an incredible hero. And there was a group of people. I grew up in Miami, Florida, when the Everglades was, a, it's very tropical. And it was so remote. And uh, so I would hunt for snakes, and uh, and then we would hunt for poisonous snakes, and at a certain point, we we actually uh, we actually formed a business, and uh, and the business was world reptiles, and we imported and exported reptiles. We supplied the world zoos with these, and uh, it was a very dangerous business. Um, <clears throat> my cousin was he and I were were cleaning the cage of a rattlesnake and he was bitten and uh, and he lost part of his hand from that. And eventually we we moved our operations down to Iquito, Peru uh, on the Amazon River. And uh, uh, you know, I would have been down there at some point, but my cousin went first. He was a little older than I was. and uh, and then he he went down in a plane crash uh, in the jungle and he was killed. So that uh, that ended that. But I still to this day I go out and uh, and hunt snakes and uh, uh, we go out to some places that are surprisingly close by the suburbs, and uh, and there are tremendous numbers of rattlesnakes and copperheads there. So. Uh, yeah, it's been something that uh, uh, something that I've done for a long time, and I just I enjoy it. There's a little bit of adrenaline that goes with it. <laughs> <laughs> One time, you know, when I when I was a child growing up, I uh, I caught a burglar in the house, and I he leaped out the window, and I chased him. I leaped out the window. I had a snake hook with me. And he pulled a knife, and the two of us fought. Oh, we went for a block fighting, and I, I could swing. I had a little more length, and he could stab. So we were just an even match until uh, finally someone turned on a porch light, and he decided to try to escape through the hedge, and and he lost sight. You know, he took his eyes off me for a second, and I swung and stabbed him about four inches in through the ball joint and and then anyway he he fled and and i was i had nothing else to fight with and i thought okay that's enough so but i was i was afraid that he would come back so one of the things that i did there was a very vulnerable part of the house where he had just pushed out the screen and come in and uh since it was a vacant room I started catching diamondback rattlesnakes, and I thought, you know, there's that's a good place for them. So I just started letting them roam on the floor. I just I put a paper sign up to say, "Do not open the door." Caution, because my sister lived with with me. I had a little sister that I took care of, but uh, uh, so uh, you know, I I grew up sort of. Uh, you know, I, I was the head of the household from the time I was 15 years old. And so I kind of made the rules up based on what seemed to make sense. And uh, uh, so so we had that we had one part of the house that was filled with uh, with vipers. So. 
we've we've come across the the end of the time of the, of the program, but I can't stop asking one more question because you're talking about poison, and I know what you've done about uh, revealing the chemical attacks um, in Syria, and you've talked about it. I've seen you on YouTube uh, exposing who's behind that venom. Well, we know by, by examining each of the three major attacks that were claimed that um, two of the three occurred. The third one, we don't even know whether there was anything. It was, it was falsified. But the, the biggest one of all was in the suburbs of, uh, of uh, Damascus uh, in Ghouta. And um, uh, this was the first one, the red line gas attack. And we know that uh, that that came from uh, uh, that came from within Turkey, that they provided the gas, and in fact uh, uh, there were two uh, parliamentarians who were enormously courageous. I have no idea if they're still alive today, but they came public and they talked about it, and they revealed that. Uh, that uh, materials for the gas were coming in out of Europe. They didn't say which country, but then they were producing the sarin gas in Turkey. And uh, this was fairly widely publicized that they caught this group of 12 Al Qaeda members and they were moving 2.2 kilograms of sarin gas across the border. And uh, uh, there was uh, an indictment, there was a prosecutor preparing the case, and then he was suddenly pulled off the case. All of the men were released, crossed over into Syria, and, uh, and went, went on down. And uh, with the coordination with the Central Intelligence Agency and MI6, they uh, together uh, this this thing was pulled off, and uh, and it was blamed on on President Bashar al-Assad. Uh, and interestingly, the, about a day before Assad was being blamed, uh, a day before the gas was was released, uh, Assad had finally gotten UN inspectors to come in because Assad said, "Look." The, these terrorists are using poison gas, and they arrived, and then all of a sudden there was a, a gas attack. So, so it was. It was. It's never been uh, instigated by Syria. It's always been by the terrorists. Um, I've also heard that you're not uh, seeking re-election, which is interesting. Um, thank you so much, uh, Senator Black. It was a great pleasure to have this uh, conversation with you. Uh, I, I'm here in my room, and we are very honored to have you in the program and to uh, act, proliferate the program outside of Iran and inside Iran. So, um, uh, I, God bless you. Thank you so much. I think you do, you've, you've done a great job. I, I don't have to compliment you. You already know, and uh, I think this um, people like yourself who are in an office, still in office right now, your senator, state senator, state senator in Virginia, significant state uh, of the founding fathers. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy that I had the occasion to speak with you from Tehran. And uh, I hope that we get another chance to either have you in person uh, or another time with, on, on the internet. Well, I look forward to it. And, you know, I'm trying to steer off this war against Iran. The you know, the latest claim is that somehow they used mines that jumped up on the side of the boat, out of the water, <laughs> jumped on the side of the boats and exploded. Well, that's impossible, and it, it has never been possible. And so the thing is so absurd, the claims that uh, any, any rational person should see right through them. But uh, anyway, I just do not want to see us kill another million people. And of course, we end up with soldiers with no legs and no arms, right. and uh, I don't want to see them get hurt either. Yes, sir.
Yes, sir. So, yes, thank indeed. you for what you're doing. Yes. And I've enjoyed talking with you today. This has been very nice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Take good care. Watch your health. And God bless you. Okay. okay. God bless you. Thank you so Bye much. now. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching this program. See you next week.